So uh, we have a really exciting panel to put together for you. We have a wonderful presentation, and uh, I'm really honored to be with this phenomenal team of, of people. Uh, we are... Um, we have a lot of content to cover, so we're going we're gonna to move through it pretty quickly and so we can try to get to the end in the, with the amount of time that we have. Uh, my name is Zach Darling. I am the Chief Eternal Optimist at the Hybrid Creative. We are one of the top full-service creative agencies for the cannabis industry. We've been in business um, about 10 years, and about a year ago, we got acquired by Kushco. And uh, I'm also moving into a new role as uh, running their sustainability initiatives and corporate social responsibility. I grew up on a hippie commune in the Emerald Triangle, raised by pot farmers, and I, I and have built uh, have had the opportunity to brand and uh, and bring to market some of the strongest brands in the cannabis industry, especially here in California. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to let my panelists introduce themselves. Uh, all of them actually don't need any introdu introduction. I'm sure you know who they are. But uh, let's just go down the line and uh, do quick introductions. Thank you. Thank you, Zach. And hello, everyone. I was in this last panel. It was so vibrant. And I know that about one-third to a little more, this is your first cannabis conference. So I often say, if you're going to play, you need your PhD in cannabis. So we'll do both PhD talk today and earlier so you can catch up to us and learn this business. I am a longtime venture capital investor, all tech. And so here's how I'm disrupting. I am leveraging all those mistakes, all those successes, all the knowledge and the resources into this cannabis industry. I am all in as an investor, advisor, and really advocate, activist in this business, now proudly for more than five and a half years. And so how exciting. It is so interesting, so vibrant. But here's the fun part of what I love to share. The war on drugs, I actually believed it. I didn't know. The stigma was upon me. How I love sharing. I mean, my kids think I'm the coolest mother in the whole world because I gave them hell when they used in high school. And now I buy them goodies and put it in their Christmas stocking. I love the fact that I have gone from understanding that the war on drugs is a war on research and science and people. And I love sharing that. And that's why I'm here talking about disruption today. Yeah. All right. Welcome, Jeannie. Uh, my name is Steve D'Angelo. I've been a cannabis activist since I was 13 years old. Uh, over the years, I've, I've, I've worked with cannabis in just about every way that you can, uh, notably in California, starting the first gold standard dispensary, Harborside, one of the first six cannabis li uh, businesses licensed in the United States. Uh, moving on to uh, co-found Steep Hill, the first cannabis analytics company, uh, and then to co-found Artview, the first cannabis investment company. All that led Willie Brown, former mayor of San Francisco, to call me father of the legal cannabis industry. Yes, and what a father we have. Thank you for your wonderful work, Steve. Thank you. We're, we're definitely not worthy. Um, You're all I got, man. You're the only children I got. <laughs> Uh, my name is Mark Grindlin. I'm the co-founder and CEO of an infused products company called Coda Signature. Uh, we launched in Colorado in uh, March of 2016, and uh, we just launched 42 days ago in California. Yay. Congratulations. 102 dispensaries in 42 days. Um, we're just really thrilled to be part of the journey. Um, I'll pass it on. Welcome, Mark. Good morning, everyone. My name is John Padilla, and I'm the Chief Knowledge Officer with New Frontier Data. And I, I couldn't be more delighted to be at this, my fourth New West Summit, to see the way um, this conference has evolved and the conversation at which uh, it sits within this just extraordinary cannabis industry um, is, is breathtaking. For those of you who might not know us, New Frontier is a research data and analytics firm focused exclusively on the, le on the legal cannabis industry. Um, and for the past little over five, and ha five years, um, we have spent you know, all of our resources, committed all our resources, trying to understand not just where the cannabis industry is today, but where it's going. Um, we work with investors, business owners, and regulators, uh, lawmakers, um, to provide the research data, analytics, and insights uh, that are fueling the decisions that are going to lay the foundation for not just the emerging legal US state-based market or national market, but laying the foundation for a truly global cannabis economy. Um, I've been a 
market analyst my entire career, and I've never seen a space that moves like this. Um, and there's a reason why you have um, you know, stakeholders of this caliber at the vanguard of the space. Um, the opportunities are immense, the challenges and risks are real. Um, but at a point when we are uh, beginning an inflection point that will define the future of legal cannabis, um, the decisions, the opportunities you pursue today uh, will truly shape this emerging global economy. Brilliant, thank you. Tim, next slide, please. So let's get started. Uh, let's, um, disruptive innovation, right? Uh, disruption uh, is synonymous with radical innovation. Uh, they go hand in hand. I would say that the word disruption is overused, misused, uh, and has kind of become a bit more of a trend. Uh, and people don't fully actually understand uh, what, what disruption is within itself. For example, uh, um, the, the, the automobile was not disruptive until Ford made it affordable for people to actually leave horse-drawn carriages and what have you. Uh, I, I feel like, let's go to the next slide too. The, uh, the, we, we are surrounded by disruptive brands all over the, all over the world in, our, in every day. We're marketed to by them and we understand which ones are really rocking the boat. Uh, here is a list of some of the more flagship disruptive brands that we uh, we know every day. And I'd just like to go through the panel a little bit and see if, if any of you want to pick out any of these or, or draw attention to them specifically and, uh, and address how you feel like they've been specifically disruptive. How about you, Jeannie? Do you want to start? You had, you had a lot to talk about with uh, regards to Ford. Well, here's, there's so many common ground. These companies to become the great brands of past times and our times, they're going through what we are going through now. A lot of ups and downs, unformed business models, unformed distribution topologies, uncertain even customers. And so those are some of the common things that are happening. And that's what I see. And pick out some of them, Steve or, or Mark or John that, you know. Well, Viagra sort of jumps out <laughs> at me. <laughs> And others. Uh, well, because I think that it falls into the category that a lot of cannabis use falls into, right? Which, which is, is not exactly curing somebody who is, is desperately ill, but is enhancing uh, uh, your life as, as more of a wellness function. Uh, arguably, in some people's eyes, more of a hedonistic and pleasurable function. So this is a conversation that we see in cannabis all the time, recreational, uh, medical, wellness. And I think that, that Viagra sort of fell into that, that same area. Yeah, but go to the next one, Zach, because that really hones in. Yeah, I, I just wanted to establish kind of a common ground of what we understand disruptive brands to be. And, uh, and those disruptive brands are also disrupting other industries and other entities. Yeah, Each one of these, we can see the backside of it, you know, of, of Netflix uh, changing, changing, you know, disrupting Blockbuster and uh, HBO and Uber disrupting uh, the taxi industry. So there are victims and there, there, there's, uh, there, there are as a carnage in the rearview mirror of, disrupt, of disruptive industries that, uh, it, that cannabis has not... Uh, been immune to. Let's go to the next slide. But Zach, let me offer something that, because I'm in conversations about brands all the time, and as you all know, brands are critical to this industry. Well, what does do that, which those companies, the traditional companies you just saw, have in common? One thing is that quality. You want, you know, if you uh, uh, buy uh, a Stella in California, it's going to taste the same in New York. So that consistency, reliability, trust factor has to be there for you to keep going back. And if so, I could just add a quick point to that. There's something um, that is reflected both across those brands and across cannabis, which is the normalization of new behavior. I did 43 speaking engagements last year. I don't know how I would have done it without Uber and Airbnb. But if you had told me five years ago that I would be riding in a strange person's car to go and stay in a strange person's house <laughs> on work travel, yeah. um, it would have seemed preposterous. And now it's completely normalized, and you know, that becomes our must moment for, where we're, we're, for some of the ways we travel reflexively. It can take a very, very short amount of time to fundamentally reshape the way consumers experience or, or integrate these new brands, these new opportunities into their lives. And we're in that inflection point right now with cannabis. So, Moving forward, I, I want to 
I want to at least stop for a moment and, uh, and give some attention to the fact that cannabis itself has been a disrupted industry. And uh, there have been some key uh, industry leaders and historic figures and straight up racism that have been the, the, the uh, per perpetuators of cannabis disruption. And I, I know that a lot of people here have a very high uh, in industry knowledge and know the history of cannabis, but we want to at least touch on this briefly and acknowledge this part of history of when cannabis itself was deeply disrupted. So um, uh, is everybody familiar with this guy here, Harry Anslinger, and the role that he played? Yes. Okay. So, so the interesting thing about Harry, there's a lot of interesting things, but uh, before he was appointed the first commissioner of the Federal Bureau of Narcotics, he was an assistant secretary of the Department of Treasury. And he was in charge of interdicting smuggled alcohol coming into the United States. Uh, he, um, uh, he was in this position. And the, the thing about alcohol, about the, about, alco about the end of alcohol prohibition, this is uh, during this period of time, we're coming up into 1930, the early 1930s. Alcohol prohibition ends in 1933. Um, uh, the... Um, so, so Anslinger is in charge of the of thousands, well, not thousands, hundreds of agents, and the he can see alcohol prohibition coming because it was a process of a constitutional amendment. So, state after state was voting on it, right? And you could sort of see it coming. Anslinger was a consummate bureaucrat, and so when he he saw the end coming, he positioned himself to become the first federal uh, commissioner, Federal Bureau of Narcotics and then use that position to uh, implement nationwide prohibition of cannabis. Interestingly, after his career, which lasted until 1961, uh, he was then appointed to be the commissioner to the United Nations, where he took his sick and twisted uh, cannabis prohibition and pushed it uh, all over the world. So um, we, you know, we, um, uh, saw the cannabis industry that existed then disrupted in some significant ways. Uh, just before the uh, prohibition of cannabis in 1937, there had been a boom in hemp production. Uh, hemp production had increased 20-fold over the course of just a decade, largely driven by technological developments, the invention of a new processing machine for hemp. Uh, and, uh, and so <clears throat> uh, when prohibition came into place, even though it was technically legally had exemptions for hemp producers, Anslinger used the law to close down hemp production. Um, medical cannabis at that time was being sold in pharmacies across the United States uh, completely legally. Uh, and so all of that trade was ended, although it did take until 1942 for the American Pharmacopeia to finally drop cannabis from its, from its pages. See, this history is important to understand. It's actually what got me over when I started to research what the heck is this industry. And I learned that this early prohibition and the racist, terrible things that this man said and others uh, started this, Next this slide, stigma. And, and I said, what? It has nothing to do with the wellness or science or harmful or good effects around the plant. What? And also those two other fabulous, yes, he said these things among many other bad boy stuff. And uh, nations around the world, people ask me all the time, well, why did Japan and, all, and the EU and all these other countries also have prohibition? Because they were watching us. And they're watching us again to see what we're doing so they can come back over to where this can be properly sold. Go they ahead. actually had their arms twisted. So uh, Anslinger and his minions went to places like South Korea and told them that they would not be getting any more aid, any more military assistance, anything, unless they implemented cannabis prohibition. They did the same thing in Nepal. They did the same thing in India. They did the same thing all around the world. See, I was shocked to learn this, and I want you to be shocked too. This is really bad. We, we have had more than 90 years of this kind of ridiculous prohibition. And so that's where I love spreading that uh, knowledge and education. I think it's critical. And the other two lovely gentlemen next to him, Hearst and DuPont, guess what? DuPont, they were making nylon array on a Dacron. World War II was coming. They did not want hemp to be that replacement material for our military. 
How sick is that? Yeah, uh, it's synthetics, DuPont, William Randolph Hearst, uh, paper, Anslinger, alcohol, and pure, pure racism. Uh, cannabis was one of the uh, early victims of uh, industry disruption. And um, let's go two slides forward. So uh, cannabis is back with a vengeance. And uh, uh, cannabis has gone from being a victim of disruption to a sleeping giant of disruption. There are a tremendous amount of different industries that, that the cannabis industry is disrupting. Let's go to the next slide. But we're gonna focus on these ones specifically. And each of our pan panelists have, have picked uh, a few to kind of focus on. So we're gonna go through it. Let's start with you, Mark. Um, I think you were gonna talk about retail and... Um, and, and alcohol. And alcohol. So, you know, I wanna put a little bit of a nuance. When we talk about disruption, um, there are very different types of disruption. I think it was um, uh, a professor at HBS that wrote The Innovator's Dilemma, uh, Clay Christensen, and he talked about this uh, sort of sustaining disruption as well as, as um, uh, or sustaining innovation versus disruptive innovation. And, you know, if you think about it, under those terms, disruptive is something that totally changes like an industry. You think about Amazon, what Amazon has done, and it was interesting listening to the last panel discussion about sort of, you know, the capital markets and what's going on. How long did Amazon uh, go before they even turned a profit? It was forever. They are now one of the most valuable companies on the planet. And it's because they, they looked at a different way of doing business. And I think, you know, when I look at at our industry, I would say that, that there's disruptive innovation against other industries. I think we're too early in our life cycle to say that we're disrupting within the industry. I think we're, we're making improvements, we're improving the retail experience, we're improving lots and lots of things, but we haven't disrupted our own industry yet, but we've certainly had an impact, let's say, on alcohol. When Constellation Brands plucks $4.1 billion to buy 45% of a company, they did it because they're looking at it as a defensive move. You know, if you follow Cowan, um, the investment bank's reports, Vivian does a great job, and she shows where cannabis has been legal and has started to mature. It started to uh, cannibalize beer sales. Um, is starting to also reduce opiate abuse where it's been in market uh, and been there for a while. So you can bet the pharmaceutical industries, the tobacco industries, the alcohol industries are looking at this very hard because they're looking at it first. There's almost a push-pull. They're trying to keep it from happening because they want to protect their moat. But they're also hedging their bets and they're putting money down and very quietly looking at this industry to figure out how they can get involved because it's net new revenue that they do not have access to. It's also very attractive margins at scale. So we're going to see more of this as it becomes more pervasive around the globe. Way more of this, okay? I will make the prediction now. It may not happen within my lifetime, but it will happen within the lifetimes of people sitting in this room today. Cannabis, by dollar volume, will be the largest product value category in the world, period. Uh, we have already uh, disrupted alcohol and pharma in very serious ways. Every cannabis reform state has seen a drop in alcohol sales, has seen a drop in binge drinking, has seen a drop in pharmaceutical sales, has seen a drop in Medicaid reimbursements. Doctors in, in cannabis reform states write 1,800 fewer opioid prescriptions uh, per year, right? And that's just taking a look at the consumable cannabis side. Not even thinking about CBD, which is disrupting all sorts of things right now. But industrial hemp is just beginning to come online. And this is going to change the face of our planet. Industrial hemp will become the basis of a new green economy. Because anything that you make out of a tree or out of petroleum or out of cotton, you can make out of hemp and you can make it more eco-friendly and when at scale, less expensively. And it includes huge product categories like paper and plastics and construction materials and food and fuel and textiles. It will, imagine, okay, imagine a truck. 
a truck that delivers these packages to us all the time, but this truck is made out of hemp plastic, okay? And, and inside that truck, all of the boxes, the cardboard is made from hemp, and so is the plastic wrapping those boxes. And what's inside the boxes? Half of those products are made out of hemp too. And the driver, her uniform and her shoes and her socks, all made out of hemp. The vehicle is powered on hemp ethanol or hemp biodiesel or electricity from a hemp powered plant. Right? Imagine a cafe with uh, linens and tablecloths and the waiter's uniform all made from hemp textiles, hemp seed in the salad, hemp seed oil for the salad dressing. Imagine the uh, tables all made out of hemp fiberboard. This is the future that we're moving into. It's amazing, isn't it? And just look how this cannabis plant is a Schedule One drug. Do you know what that means? No health benefits in any way. And this is shocking, the prohibition. Thank God, loosening up a little bit on hemp, but certainly not fully. And we haven't exploited or explored these opportunities for all these wonderful additional things you just heard Steve say. Just two quick thoughts about, one, the politics of cannabis. The fact that virtually every Democratic candidate running for president has declared some sort of you know, support for expansion of uh, federal laws, fundamental reform of uh, federal policy, whether that's decriminalization, de shuttling, um, or of outright legalization, means that cannabis as an issue is going to be central to the 2020 debate. The Republicans are going to have to come up with a response given that this is an animating issue for a number of voters. It may not be the single issue that they're voting on, uh, but it is a propulsive issue for people who, particularly those who are benefiting from, from the medical side. Um, and by virtue of this being a central issue in the upcoming presidential election, an election that, under the circumstances, is going to be extremely closely watched, will mean that this gives cannabis a global platform in a way that I don't think we've, we have ever seen before. And so when we start thinking about the global context, and I think that's really important. I know being in California, the most important cannabis uh, state market and arguably the most important cannabis market in the world, um, it's very easy to, to be heads down building as this market grows, and that's totally understandable. But I would just urge the stakeholders, particularly in California, where we have some of the most experienced producers, processors, and retailers uh, in the world, to start considering what's emerging on a global basis. In the time that we've been doing this, we've gone from about four or five countries where there was a meaningful cannabis conversation happening to over 60. Um, to date, the, the total global legal market um, is probably a little over about 20 billion. Based on New Frontier's latest, latest estimates, total global demand for cannabis in the world today is over $350 billion. Wow. We have barely scratched the tip of the iceberg just on existing consumers. That doesn't include all of the industrial applications. That doesn't include all of the medicinal applications. And so you can quickly start to see how this snowballs. And with the number of countries that are looking very closely at the Americans who adopted prohibition based on American pressure um, are now seeing us, uh, seeing the pendulum swing differently here. They're reassessing themselves. Um, and, so, and it's also critical to understand that if it has taken California 50 years to get to this point, Countries that are where California was 50 years ago are going to cover that ground in 10 to 15 years. This is going to move at a pace globally that where they're taking all of the lessons learned here and uh, applying them there. So if you think that, oh, we'll build here and wait five years before we start, turning, uh, start thinking on a global basis, um, you will find that the global market by that point will be large, hyper-competitive, and the stakeholders who got in early will have really key strategic advantages. You know, I'd just like to uh, go back to something. You know, the, the premise of, of the session is disruption. And if you think about sort of the context of the election coming up where we've got bipartisan support, it, you know, we did an analysis last year where we looked at uh, the composition of state representatives and senators from every single state that has legalized cannabis, and it's pretty much bipartisan support. With all of the noise that's going on um, in Washington right now, the one thing that you can't take away is this focus on job creation. And one of the things that cannabis is doing is disrupting our U.S. economy in terms of bringing positive job growth. You know, just in Colorado, where we started out <clears throat> last year, the economic impact to the state was $4.2 billion. 32,000 people employed full-time in the industry. 
There are a thousand dispensaries in Colorado, more dispensaries in Colorado than Starbucks and McDonald's put together. It is the fastest growing uh, industry in the United States. And so if you're a senator from a state that has legalized, and when we start looking at you know, the Safe Banking Act, when we look at the State Rights Act, um, it's gonna be really hard to say no to that when you have to go back to your constituents and, and say, look, I don't want job growth in my state. Uh, that's gonna be that's gonna be a tough sell. Now, I, I do think there are bigger priorities right now in DC, but I think as the momentum continues, and I've been looking at the number of states that are looking to legalize, you know, over the next year and a half, uh, for recreational, it's it's a tsunami that's happening, and it's going to be really hard to stop it. So I'm so glad, Mark, that you brought up job creation because just to relate it to you sitting in this room, you are here, 2019, to connect, to learn, to possibly join us in the industry. We want that. Maybe that is what you want. This is a good thing, and this is how you do it. So learning about the business. Uh, going to all these incredible uh, uh, dispensaries that are right here in this fabulous state. Oh my golly, it's blown me away. Feel sorry for me. I'm in New York City. Guess what? No flour, no edibles, and 10, 10 licenses, each vertical, and each of us get to grow, manufacture, and get four dispensaries, all medical, high-priced products, very few products sitting on the shelf. Can you imagine if there were only 40 drugstores in the entire state of New York? You couldn't get anything. So I often say some woman didn't figure out those rules, believe me. But, but this is how I take hope. Luckily, I get to come to Colorado and California and other adult use states and see. If you haven't been to Harborside, it's important part of your learning to go to Steve's unbelievable dispensary sitting there in Oakland and have an experience where you can look at the package and put it in your basket. I love that. I love that. It's incredible. And so what I'm saying to you is uh, this, these states and what's happened here, especially in California, is a showcase to those of us who are on the barren deserts of the East Coast. <laughs> L luckily, Massachusetts has awakened. Illinois has awakened. But it is just ridiculous that we can't enjoy, like you all have, built these beautiful products and these beautiful stores and businesses and opportunity. But what I'm saying to you is join us if that's what you want. Come be with us. It's so, as you heard, not only the numbers, but the opportunity. It's incredible. Brilliant. It's, uh, next slide, Steve. Thank you, everyone. So, uh, you know, Mark, Mark brought up that uh, he, he's, he doesn't see that there's been a lot of disruption in the cannabis industry. The cannabis industry hasn't disrupted itself as much. I, I would I would venture to say that that um, there are a number of businesses out there and uh, organizations and thought leaders and entrepreneurs that are uh, that, that are being disruptive. It doesn't have to just be disruptive. Like we said, disruption is synonymous w with radical innovation. Uh, and um, you know, I, I keep thinking we are in the middle of a huge disruption right now with this with this vape crisis. This we are experiencing what it feels like for the cannabis industry to be self disrupted uh, as it is. Um, but for, let's go to the next slide. For a brief moment, I'd like to at least ta uh, touch on the businesses of each of our panelists here and find out what you, each of you feel you're doing that is consi considerably innovative and kind of pushing the status quo. I'm proud that you heard me in my introduction. I've been a 30-year technology investor, and so to be able to leverage that, I've been part of the ArcView team. I am helping ArcView. Uh, create fabulous events. I have had so much feedback because last week we had our first Manhattan event. It was pretty fabulous, wasn't it, Steve? And uh, so that's been exciting. And now we're morphing that to scale that business to add members and bring them investment platforms. So we're morphing into an invest, an asset management business to bring our members and guests and people who come to ArcView a variety of, of investing opportunities and vehicles because we know you want to play. You want to be part of this upside. I'm proud to leverage my many years of experience to help do that. It's pretty exciting. 
Thank you, Gene. Yeah, I'll speak on HarperSight in a second, but just to, to close the loop on ArcView, I think the interesting thing about ArcView is that, you know, in the very beginning of the industry, we were just funding startups because that's all there was, right? Uh, we were an angel investor network because that's that was the level of investment that we were all at. And now, as the industry has grown, as some of the companies that came to us for seed capital are now coming back to us for later rounds, we've had to morph that business model to accommodate those growing needs of the industry. And I'm proud to say that we, as a membership, have put more than $280 million to work over the years, thanks to your efforts, Steve and Troy. Uh, and now it's and and you and it's about every cannabis company you can think of. So that's been pretty exciting journey, and and really seeded that industry. So on the harbor side side, um, you know we originally were I think disruptive and radically innovative just by. Uh, opening the first gold standard cannabis retail, where we actually put money, thought, and effort into the build out, into the design, into the training, the recruiting, the customer service, and created a, a retail experience, you know, equal to or superior than, than fine stores like Nordstrom's, where some of our leaders were recruited from. Um, over the years, we've, we've had the opportunity, as reform has gone apace, to, to continue expanding into new realms. So one of the things that we are super excited about, and this is a, a recent development, is that we have now been able to put to sleep what I call the post office or general store model of cannabis retailing, where everybody lines up, and there's a case, and there's people behind the counter, and you wait in line, and you wait in line a little bit more, and then you get up there, and then you have a conversation. And, Right? You walk into Harborside now, you pick up your basket, you browse the aisles, you pick out the products you want, you put them into your basket, and you take them to checkout. Right? Uh, doesn't seem radical in the context of retailing. We put the general store to bed in this country 100 years ago. But in the context of cannabis, uh, it is. And, uh, and it's working really well. The feeling in the room is just entirely different. Another thing that, uh, that we'll be doing uh, now, Oakland's one of the rather few jurisdictions in the state that have allowed on-site consumption. So we have a tasting room that is getting ready to open, and we're going to be sort of figuring out uh, how does a cannabis social space work and what business models actually function well in that kind of space. So um, next time we all get together, I can tell you a little bit more about how that all worked out. So, you know, for Coda Signature, um, when my business partner uh, approached me in the summer of 2014, she had been in the industry from the very early days in Colorado. And at the time, she was looking for help on a business plan. And this is actually Coda Signature is my fifth startup. But at the time, I was working for a, a very large public company. And it was just very interesting to me. So we started to look at it. And... You know, I, I had the, the wonderful experience of working in the advertising world. I worked for uh, YNR, one of the largest, uh, now part of WPP, one of the largest global uh, advertising holding groups in the world. And so I had the opportunity to work with amazing brands, Apple, American Express, IBM, you know, very, very long list. And from that experience, what I did know intuitively was that you know, brands at the end of the day is what people focus on. And when we started to look in 2014 at the industry in Colorado, we really didn't see any strong brands. We looked, uh, there were early brands that were there, but when we looked at quality, it was something that you mentioned, Jane, we didn't see anything that was really positioned as premium. And so one of the things that we wanted to do was bring something that was very unique at the time into the Colorado market. And we were very fortunate to find a young woman who has, uh, she was classically trained as a chocolatier at the Valrona School in Southern France. And she worked at Per Se in New York for a number of years uh, as a dessert chef. So Lauren joined us on this crazy journey. And what we were able to do was bring just really spectacular products to the market, but we made a strategic decision to do it at price parity with the market because we didn't want to create ourselves as sort of this niche premium brand. And so for Coda Signature, it's been a, a wonderful journey. We've got a full line of edibles, topicals, and concentrates 
number one in market share in Colorado, I think, with about 24 percent. And, you know, when I look at our combined sort of uh, number of stores that we're, we're in right now, it's about 730 stores. So in a very short period of time, when we've been able to get a lot of traction, but it's been a tenacious focus on quality, consistency, all the things that you see in some of the brands we saw up there. Thank you, Mark. So when we began doing this as New Frontier Data, you know, a data analytics company in cannabis, when there was no such thing as cannabis data, and at least not in meaningful sense. <laughs> Um, as somebody who's been a kind of data and analytics junkie my entire career, I'd, I'd never been in, a, in an environment where not only was there such a shortage of data, there was a true data aversion. You know, one of the first master growers I spoke to told me that at the end of every cultivation cycle, he would burn all of his notes. Cause he, and as a data person, I'm like, no, you've got to be kidding me. You know, 30 years of data burnt. But that was the environment we were coming into. Um, we've had the privilege of building just an extraordinary team of analysts, economists, data scientists, statisticians, uh, consumer data and, uh, specialists. And what began as piecing little data points from different markets, we would take anything that we could find, um, over time has grown into, I would argue, the most comprehensive base of, basis of data um, on the global cannabis economy. That's been really important because what that, that's allowed us to do is two things. It allows us to see the industry holistically. We're not just looking at retail. We're not just looking at uh, taxes and you know, number of licenses. We're looking across it all. And that allows us to see the connection points between things like the regu regulations and demand on consumers. What effect does raising taxes by 5% have on consumer retail demand? Um, it enables us to see, understand things like the interplay between medical and recreational markets. How does the activation of one impact the participation of patients in, in the other? Um, and it enables us to forecast how new markets are going to perform uh, as they emerge and evolve. Uh, I, I was blown away when uh, we were doing a review of our last California projections and realized that our forecast came in at 0.3% of the actuals. We've gotten really, really good at um, and that's testament just to the team that we have that is, that is truly extraordinary. But as we start taking all of the lessons learned in the U.S. and start now looking at a global economy, the ability to leverage that basis of data, not only to continue to refine um, our understanding of the American market at a time when there's literally close to a little over a dozen states that could be candidates for legalization in the 2020 cycle, um, but also starting to look at all of these new countries that are beginning to emerge. Um, I think we're uniquely positioned uh, to understand uh, not just where things are going, but how the decisions made today are going to impact the market five and ten years from now. Thank you, John. So let's go to the next slide, please. So I've asked our panelists to, uh, uh, myself and all, all of our panelists here, have uh, can put together this list of who we see being particularly disruptive or in innovative right now in the cannabis industry. People who have challenged the status quo, people who, who have rocked the boat, uh, businesses that have changed the way things are done, uh, uh, pioneers that have kind of forged a path forward for other other people. Uh, I'm sure there are, are many more businesses and many more innovators that belong on this list, but this is a handful that we'd like to kind of focus on and just go around and take turns uh, identifying what really made them innovative. And as much as I love a panel where everybody agrees with each other and nods their heads, <laughs> if, some, if, if uh, I, I feel free to challenge each other. Really, let's put this to the test. What is radical innovation? What is disruption? And how are these people actually changing it? You start, I'm, I'm happy to lead off. First of all, I do want to honor many business owners and entrepreneurs I see right in this room. So I'm building some fabulous brands, so good for you. And if you've got a brand in your mind, I'm encouraging you. Make it happen. But just now when you heard Mark say he was in more than 700 stores, he didn't sit in Colorado, put them in a box, and start shipping them uh, away to other states. It is hard to get that distribution. So to me, disruption is our ability for this vast distribution and somebody that I put on the list is my friend, fabulous woman, Lynn Hondert, who built Mary's Medicinals. She is one of the very few brands that has scaled to more than 12 states. And now she's in some luxury hotels and just got a wonderful acquisition after her many years of hard work building a beautiful brand of both THC products and CBD products. I think that's pretty impressive right there. 
Absolutely. Just one quick note, everyone. Just because we have a lot we want to cover and we are running a little tight on time now, let's uh, let's try to bang through these sure. and, 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 and get to the point for each one of them as quick as we, as we can so we can try to cover them all. Me? What about you, Steve? What oh, about me. The last okay, well, um, I, you know, I, I, I am a real fan of the Flow Canna business model, um, which is, you know, in contrast to most of the new cannabis companies that are, that are being set up, which are going for, you know, huge uh, vertical um, uh, cultivation. Uh, Flow Canna is seeking to leverage the incredible amount of expertise, genetics, culture, and terroir that there is in the Emerald Triangle and, and ensure that a place remains for our legacy growers uh, who have been carrying this plant uh, through prohibition for all of these years. So I'm a huge fan of Flow Canna. I think the jury is probably still out on exactly how disruptive it will be, but I hope it will be quite disruptive. Uh, just a quick personal note with that. Uh, Flow Canna is actually at the foot of the hippie commune that I grew up on. And uh, last uh, couple of weeks ago, we got to go and do a tour of the farm that's on the land that I used to live on as a child. And it's just really beautiful to see how uh, they are preserving the mom and pop farmer. The work that they're doing by, by, by supporting them and providing uh, the distribution and the, and the uh, fulfillment, it's allowing these farmers that were really on the brink of, of, of having to sell their land the opportunity to continue forward. I think that the only, the big answer to large corporate cannabis entities is strength in numbers of the, of the small mom and pops. And, and I, I, I agree with you, Flocon is really helping them stay alive. So I'll talk a little bit about Native Roots. Um, <clears throat> they're the largest retailer in Colorado. I think they've got 32 retail licenses between medical and, and uh, adult use. And one of the things that they did, um, and I think, you know, disruptive within the industry, they made sure that as they started to roll out the dispensaries, they had sort of the same look and feel. So whether you went into one in one part of the state or another part of the state, you knew what to expect, um, which is kind of standard in, in regular retail. What they're doing now, which I really like, is they're really thinking about the overall customer experience from uh, whether it's a, a mobile application online or the retail store where you can order ahead of time. You can uh, look at how your order is, is uh, being processed on your mobile app. But what they're also doing now is starting to partner with some of the brands that, that uh, are, are meaningful to them where if you look at sort of analogs like uh, a Best Buy where you would see kind of a store within a store, you know, where you'd see like the Apple section, what they're doing is partnering with, with brands to really showcase those brands. And it's, it's also an additional revenue stream for them. So I think they're doing some really interesting things. They're really starting to look at inventory management, things like planograms, pretty standard stuff outside of, of the cannabis industry, not so standard within the industry. Um, I'll talk about two companies who I think fall in the same category of disruption, and it's disrupting the historical cannabis consumer experience. Candescent and Lucid Moods. Both companies, Candescent on the flower side, Lucid Mood on the disposable vape side, have positioned themselves as effect-based companies. So if we have long traditionally associated cannabis consumption based on strains, you know, OG, Kush, Blue Dream, Girl Scout cookies, these companies are looking at things like effect, uh, effects like relax, create, sleep, uh, energy. And that's a radical disruption to the way um, consumers engage with cannabis. It's going to take a while for this evolution to happen, particularly amongst deep connoisseurs. But I think increasingly, as an industry, given the number of strains out there and the challenge that the lay consumer has keeping track with what is the difference between my consuming you know, Girl Scout cookies versus Golden Goat. I, to most consumers, particularly those in markets which haven't made this transition or don't have the depth of history that a market like California does, the ability to say, just give me something that's going to make me a little more creative. Give me something that's going to improve my workout. Give me something that'll help me sleep better. Give me something that I can go out to the club with. Um, it will, there will be a period of transition, but we think that this idea of effects-based nomenclature relative to a strain-based naming will start to gain some equity in this market. And that changes the way consumers shop and start thinking about how they integrate and where they integrate cannabis into their lives.
Let me push back on you just please, a little bit, John. Please. And um, I think that there is a huge need in the marketplace for consumers to have a system which helps them navigate towards the best choice, given the wide range of different types of cannabis that are out there. And what we have now is indica sativa and hybrid or strain names, which are unscientific and, and don't really give you that reliable system. So there are a lot of companies who are working on that roadmap. Um, some of them, and I'm not gonna get into particular company names, uh, have been putting out products that claim that, that you can um, uh, anticipate a certain effect. Bliss, charge, calm, etc. When I've talked to these companies, and I've talked to every single one of them that I've been able to come into contact with and ask them what their scientific method was for assigning effect, they all told me focus groups. In a shockingly large number of groups, those focus groups were employees of the company. <laughs> and I've asked them all one simple question. Did you intentionally mislabel the product uh, so you put up on down and down on up or day on night and night on day and then give them to the focus groups and see what kind of difference that you had from when they were labeled accurately? Not one has done it yet. The, the effects of cannabis is very, is very so differently for each person. It's, it's challenging to put that kind of uh, label on it. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to join in on this. I'd like to point out sauna packaging. Um, as a, a, a person who's in the packaging industry, my parent, parent company, Kushco, is actually rolling out a whole line of compostable plastics uh, to replace the plastic pop top and, uh, and vape cart holders. But Sauna did something really tremendous over this last year that I think uh, deserves some attention. They already have a line of hemp-based uh, uh, plastics, but they just re uh, brought, pulled in four tons of ocean plastic out of, the, out of the ocean and turned it into cannabis packaging. That's moving in the right direction. Okay, we're gonna, we're gonna a little tight in time, so let's jam through a few more and see how more, many more we can get out before we get cut off, all right? Well, uh, if, as you work on your PhD, you know, that one in cannabis, feel free to take a picture of that slide because that's where you could start. Here are some of the best practices or let's say interesting practices company that have built some great brands. So what I do is I go to dispensaries. You often have to ask permission to do what I'm about to tell you. But I always ask, may I take uh, photos? Because I like learning all the brands. And I heard Sumit, my friend, who just spoke in the last session, say, and I agree with this, I know this to be true, there are about 32,000 brands out there of these cannabis brands. That's a lot. So here's just a short form of where you can start your research if you're not sure. And so uh, I, you know, am in dispensaries all the time, taking my pictures and learning these brands. And I, I love... Uh, my friend who has built garden societies, these little beautiful mini pre-rolls, Erin Gore, she's right here in this area. I love Lowell Smokes, such a beautifully packaged with not only some matches in there, but a place to strike it. Just the way these products are packaged attracts me as a consumer. Uh, yeah, so... Um... Steve... Can you, can you share a little bit about Last Prisoner Project with us? And then... Well, I'd be happy to. Uh, the Last Prisoner Project is, uh, is a project to disrupt uh, some of the worst consequences of prohibition, uh, and that being the 40,000 people who are currently still incarcerated on cannabis crimes in the United States. Some of them are there for life sentences, for nonviolent cannabis crimes. That means they will die in prison if we don't get them out. And so I uh, launched the Last Prisoner Project um, several months ago uh, with the objective of making sure that every single cannabis prisoner on planet Earth is freed. Um, we have, I think, as a legal industry, both a moral imperative to do that and just this wonderful, wonderful opportunity to do the right thing, to set an example for other kinds of industries, to establish ourselves not just as another new industry, but as a whole new kind of industry. Yes. I'd like to build on um, Steve's pushback because I think it's really important. And one of the things about the way innovation is happening in this space, and we can use this effect-based model as an illustration, the, the companies that are doing it 
some are doing quite well, methodology notwithstanding, because there's consumers who are responding to it. And what that should tell all of us is that even as this industry grows, there's so much room for innovation to take what's being done and improve upon it, use real science to inform product development um, rather than anecdote and reflex. And so as you look at the opportunities in this space, just because somebody is doing it doesn't mean it's been done the best way it can be done and that there aren't new and novel ways to approach a similar solution that optimize the consumer experience and um, both from a retail standpoint, from a packaging standpoint, um, and from a kind of ingesting-based uh, response to your cannabis products. We are literally still scratching the tip of this iceberg. Um, there's a long road ahead to, to continue to build and innovate products that reflect the gold standards of the regular consumer economy. Um, and even though it feels like, you know, cannabis is a huge amount of wilderness sales, like the, the train has left the station, make no mistake, there's still tremendous opportunity for disruption uh, as this industry continues to grow. I think one, one example that I'd really love to point out is Acreage Holdings. They did this. This is the perfect example of disruptive marketing. They uh, this last year they tried running a, a medical marijuana ad on the Super Bowl, and um, of course NBC turned them down. But by trying and getting turned down, within two weeks they had already received over four billion impressions. That's a perfect example of trying to be disruptive and being radically innovative on a marketing level. I would say MedMen's New Normal video that they put out with, uh, directed by Spike, Spike Lee, uh, or Spike Jones, uh, is, a, is a beautiful example. I would say innovation, normalcy is innovation, just so how uh, Harborside creating a traditional shopping experience is an innovative idea. Uh, you know, us continuing to push brands and businesses and business models to a, nor a level of normalcy in, in America and in the world is, uh, is, you know, is truly innovative and uh, disrupting uh, many other different facets. D did you want to jump in? Yeah, well, I, 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 yes. I, you know, I think that there's also this other sort of sleeping giant of disruption that we haven't mentioned yet that, that ha is really uh, changing the face of cannabis around the world, and that's the opening of the Canadian public markets uh, to cannabis companies and the billions and billions of dollars of capital that are flowing into the industry now uh, all around the world, uh, California, Colorado, all over the place. And I think that, um, that some of that is, is very positive. We are, you know, we're seeing cannabis companies who now for the first time have the kind of capital that are needed to really create compelling brands and take significant amounts of market share. On the other hand, um, I think that, that a lot of the business models that are being developed by the investment bankers and attorneys who are the most powerful people in the Canadian public markets um, lack any real connection or understanding of cannabis and, uh, and, and I fear uh, consequences of that. So I think there's a lot of good and a lot of bad out of the Canadian uh, public markets. Either way, they've changed everybody's life that I know in the industry. Thank you. Uh, could we do the next slide, please? So in closing, uh, your competition is not another cannabis brand. Your competition is industry noise. It's industry clutter. It's brand clutter. If you're starting a business and you want to actually be innovative and you want to challenge the status quo and you want to rock the, bo the boat, you need to dance to the beat of your own drum and defy the herd. There's a brand brawl coming to cannabis and the question that every entrepreneur should be asking themselves is how will you challenge the status quo? Thank you. We've got some time left for questions, but thank you, everybody. Thank you to all of our amazing panelists for joining us in this conversation. Yeah, and a word of thanks to Zach, who's just been like an all-star panel moderator. <laughs> I, I guess we don't have time for questions. Thanks, everybody.